Hello everyone, this is Uncharted X, my name is Ben, and this is part two of my look into the enigmatic and mysterious megalithic site of Sacsayhuaman that sits just above Cusco in Peru. In the previous video, we took a look at the location of Sacsayhuaman and its relationship to Cusco, and also dug into some of the Incan symbology and the mythology that surrounds this site. In this video, part two, we're going to focus on the architecture and take a guided tour around all of the different areas of Sacsayhuaman, including some of the areas that not many people take the time to go and see. We're going to look at the evidence for multiple styles of architecture on this site and the idea that maybe the Inca, instead of building this site from scratch, instead found it as an abandoned megalithic ruin and then rebuilt the site. They used it, they respected it and they integrated it into their culture. I am going to spend a minute to just set up the discussion about the architecture though because fundamentally there are three different styles that we'll see across Sacsayhuaman and indeed this is something you can see across many of the sites in the Sacred Valley and we'll be referring back to these styles as we go along. If this is the first time you're hearing about these different styles, these different types of architecture in South American masonry, I do have a whole video on the topic. Uh, it talks about why I think a lot of the megalithic masonry that we see in particular is older than the actual Incan civilization, and you'll find a link to that below in the description. I do favor Jesus Gamara's classification system. Both he and his father have been researching these sites and looking into these different types of architecture for more than 50 years. They published several books in Spanish. I've met Jesus on a couple of occasions. I have to say I'm not really uh, into most of his theories, but in terms of his classification system, the way that he identifies the different types of architecture, it's, it's one of those things that it just becomes elegantly simple after the fact. When you first realize it or you first really see it, it's your brain just goes, of course, and then it's something that you can't ever unsee. And in this case, it's when you realize there are these three architectural styles on these sites. It just all clicks into place. Fundamentally, there are three styles, and the oldest style is called Hanan Pacha. And this is the monolithic style. This is the... Uh, the carvings, the strange shapes that you see wrought into the hillsides itself. It's not, you know, it's not all blo many blocks. There's, there's only one piece usually. It's one part of the living rock itself. This always looks extremely eroded relative to other work. It's always at the bottom layer you see on many of these sites. There's often other masonry built up on top of it. Uh, and it's at the center of a lot of these sites. Uh, to me, this is quite obviously, it just looks more ancient. Uh, often you'll see it in... in a lot of disarray, They're as if there's been damage and destruction wrought on these sites. Then there's a second style, it's called Uran Pacha, and this is the classic South American megalithic style. It's the cellular walls, it's the multiple blocks, it's the super precise and uh, very tightly joined walls that just are of an extremely high level of craftsmanship. This is the megalithic work, for want of a better term. Quite often it's made of a single type of stone. Usually it's stone that's had to have been moved in from the area. It's not, not always local stone. This work can also be vitrified or very shiny on the surface. We see this work everywhere. We see it in Cusco, Alante, Tambo. Obviously the zigzag walls of Sacsayhuaman are probably the best example. We'll be looking closely at those. There's quite clearly a third style that we see here. It's called Ikun Pacha, and this is the Incan work. This is the loose stone walls. Sometimes there might be some mud mortar used in them, but it's the, the fairly primitive work that's been used and done to repair these sites. I think the Inca are responsible for all of this work. It's all of their terracing. I mean, they were prolific builders with this style. The Ikun Pacha work is easily explainable by the Inca's capabilities. It's very much in line with the way that they built other things with their artwork. It's not precise, but it, they were very prolific at it, and they were quite talented in some areas. But they just didn't have the capability to move around the types of stones that we're looking at in Sacsayhuaman, nor did they really have the capability to get to the level of precision that we see in this work. And really, God only knows who did the oldest work, the Hanan Pacha work. Some of that is just, it's, it's almost, it's so strange, it's hard to even relate it to, you know, like a human civilization. Christ, here we go. Ben's talking aliens. I'm not talking aliens. So just a little bit of background on the different styles. So look out for these three different styles as we go around Sacsayhuaman. 
And we'll start that tour by looking at what is the most famous part of Sacsayhuaman, the zigzag walls. Uh, typically when you get to this site, the tourist, the taxi or the, uh, the bus will take you to either one side or the other of this plaza and right in front of you that just captures your attention is this incredible set of zigzag megalithic walls that extends up five terraces to the top of this mountain. We're going to get a good look at most of the areas of Sacsayhuaman here from a lot of different angles as we walk around. Some of these blocks are just insanely big. I mean, the scale is really hard to get to grips with until you actually go up and stand next to it and you can get a sense for just how heavy and how large a lot of this masonry is. We don't really know exactly what's under the ground here. I know some of these blocks have been excavated and then been refilled in. Uh, some of the bigger blocks do go down 12, even 15 feet. I think the tallest block on this site is nearly 30 feet tall from bottom to top, including what's in the ground. The estimates on these blocks, I think the most credible estimates put some of the largest ones at over 150 tons. I mean, just look at the size of some of these blocks. They're, they're truly gigantic. But I've heard estimates as up to approximately 400 tons, which is probably pushing it a little bit. But um, certainly some of these are, you know, 150 tons or more. We're walking along the face of the wall here on the bottom level. And again, this site was buried in soil by the Spanish at one point. It's been excavated. And one of the interesting questions that you can think about is, is this actually the real ground level from when the excavation started? There's a lot of dirt and we'll get a good look at some of the backsides of these walls and then what's on top of them. The other thing to remember is that all of the walls have been extensively quarried and that most experts will tell you that they were at least three to four meters higher than what they are now. There are five courses when it comes to these zigzag walls, so there's different levels that go up. The biggest stuff is at the bottom, but there's some really uh, huge stones that are also up in the higher courses, as well as at the other side of this courtyard area that stretches out in front of Sacsayhuaman. If, as we turn around, you'll actually see the other features of Sacsayhuaman. There's an entire hilltop, it's called the Rotadero. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but that is a natural extrusion of lava, of rock, that rounded shape. But you also see megalithic walls, and it does qualify as Hunan Pacha because in many areas of that rocky hillside, we'll see a lot of carvings and shapes that have been put into that stone. I'd really love some of these shots. I, I use them quite a bit of the wall, and as we walk up close, uh, as you see the, the, the so-called Puma's Paw, and we get a closer look at one of the bigger blocks that is on this site. This footage is actually walking from the other end of that same wall. We started over at one side and now we're at the other end. It's really interesting and as we go further up, you'll see some of the masonry style change just a little bit. It become, It's sort of less rounded and becomes more straight and more precise the higher up the mountain as we go. You can also see here the Inca construction, clearly. You can obviously see the small work that the Inca have done to then repair what's happened on this site. I think that the Inca repaired megalithic work as best as they could. When you really look at these walls, you know, they're only going together in one particular way. It would be like putting together a giant jigsaw puzzle. And they really only fit in one spot. I wouldn't be surprised if the Inca actually repaired parts of this because we see evidence for Inca repair work happening in many other megalithic sites. This also, I think, explains why in some cases you can see some megalithic uh, sites that have some smaller stones sort of underneath them as foundations. You see this occasionally in a couple of places at Cusco in the streets. You also see it at Alante Tambo with a couple of this to the, the giant megalith sized blocks. A couple of those have been propped up and, and moved and they've got some smaller stones underneath them. I think this is simply just the Inca repair work. I think they put together and they fixed what they could. And because these stones only fit together in a very precise single orientation and in a single spot, they, in some cases, they may have had to build up a little bit of foundation under these stones. And I think that's what you're looking at. I don't think they made the walls. I don't think they were capable of hauling these stones up and down the mountainside, particularly at Alante Tambo. The quarry for the granite at Alante Tambo is actually at the top of the mountain across the valley from it. In this picture, you can actually see Graham Hancock pointing it out. 
but that's the quarry. They had to bring these giant sort of 100 ton plus stones all the way down, cross the river, and then bring them up this steep mountainside to the top at Alante Tambo. And in fact, there's actually one stone that's been left uh, halfway up the mountainside at Alante Tambo. When they put the road in, they had to build the road around this stone. They weren't going to be able to move it. There's additional proof of renovation in the Inca walls themselves at Saxe Huaman. I haven't found a picture of this, but I've read the reports that said that in some of the Inca walls that were built at Saxe Huaman, so some of the repairs where they built up their walls on top of the older megalithic work, in the backfill for those walls, some of those backfills, they contained megalithic blocks, which is kind of an interesting uh, observation when you get to thinking about it. When, if you are claiming that the Inca built the entire wall, so both styles with the megalithic style and then the sort of loose rock style, why are there megalithic blocks in the backfill for that wall? If you are the one making that block, it's going to have a home, it's going to be in a wall somewhere. But if you're like the Inca likely were, if you found that site, you couldn't find where this block went, you were going to use it, you might as well use it. So they actually put it into one of their walls as backfill. To me, that's pretty clear evidence that they came along and had found a bunch of megalithic stuff laying around and they rebuilt as much of it as they could. But what they didn't rebuild, they, they used. And you can see this in the streets of Cusco. There are so many examples of where they've reused the megalithic blocks that they couldn't actually put back in their original location. You see megalithic blocks inserted as the lentils in doorways in Cusco. You see them put into walls. You see entire structures that have been rebuilt by using megalithic blocks, but they've been rebuilt with like cement when the Spanish, they did the same thing. The Inca would use those megalithic blocks if they couldn't actually repair them. As we move up to the top of the hill here, stone blocks change to andesite. So it's not just limestone at Sacsayhuaman. A lot of the actual foundation work and the, the construction that's on top of the hill is all made of andesite. And as you can see, many of these blocks are very straight edged. They were highly valued for quarrying. That's why there's very few of them left up here. But these andesite blocks and these straight edged blocks, they look very similar to some of the architecture that you see in the Coricancha. And to me, they also remind me of some of the things that you will see at Pumapunku or Tiwanaku in Bolivia. As I quoted in the last video, not a house in Cusco, particularly not those built by the Spanish, isn't made from the blocks that were quarried from this site. As we go up on top of the mountain, there is a very interesting structure up here, and it's a structure that we can only see the foundations for today. Some people call it the Eye of the Puma. It has a few other names, but it's this huge circular geometric set of, of, of circular masonry. And this was once a structure that had at least four or five levels to it. This was reported by Spanish chroniclers. There's been uh, a number of people that have reported what this structure originally was. Unfortunately, it's all fully been quarried, so we really don't know what this looks like or what this looked like originally. It's been reported that there were as many as three towers at the top of the hill here, so you may have had three circular constructions, all consisting of multiple levels of masonry, uh, but today we just have the foundations. Pretty much everything here has been quarried and the stone's been reused in probably half the buildings in ancient Cusco. And what's interesting is, is that this type of masonry is very similar to the Coricancha and it's likely that Sacsayhuaman may have flowed all the way down the hill to the Coricancha originally as all part of one giant megalithic construction. As you can see Cusco behind the eye of the puma here, down that hill is Manco Capac's palace and there we see those megalithic walls that have masonry just like what we find at the top here and if you keep going in that direction you'll eventually hit the Coricancha. I think it was all part of one giant original megalithic construction. As we walk up here, you see we get a better view of the Rotodero. A lot of these cellular walls on the Rotodero are quite large as well. There's multiple terraces over there. Very few people really go over and take a close look at it. But what's interesting over there is you can actually see that the level of the ground or the level of the rocks goes down into the ground, which tells you that maybe the original ground level wasn't where it is today. Either that or they deliberately built a wall that seems to be sort of heading directly into the ground. But to me, it's more likely that I think the ground level was at a different place and, and what we experience on the site today is, me is merely that that's been excavated in modern times. 
In terms of how these walls were built, well, there's lots and lots of different opinions on that. The idea that they're all quarried and they were moved in here and shaped. The actual quarry location isn't really well known for Sacsayhuaman. Brian Forrester has a couple good videos where they were off looking at various limestone hills because the hill here isn't limestone. These limestone blocks were definitely moved in and brought in from somewhere else. Where that exact quarry is, there's a lot of speculation. There are limestone hills within sort of 10 kilometers of this area, and some of those do have what look like quarry marks. Uh, there's no obvious quarries, but it seems likely that they were brought in from a distance, you know, anywhere up to 10 or perhaps even further kilometers away, which is just astonishing when you're talking about loads of 150 tons or more and steep hillsides like you have in Peru and the elevation. The geopolymer theories, it's an interesting idea. I, I'm yet to be fully convinced of it. I, I'm waiting for somebody to actually do an experiment to say, well, here's your limestone block that looks just like this and I've made it out of geopolymer and here's the process. I do know that there's been some work done at Bolivar and Tiwanaku, carbon found inside the andesite stones, which doesn't make any sense. It's some interesting investigation work going in there and I thoroughly hope that they continue down that path to figuring it out. But as far as I know, that work hasn't really been done at Sacsayhuaman yet. It's a different type of stone it is a slightly different form of architecture than Tiwanaku. So, you know, I hope we get there. I hope that, that there is an analysis done at Sacsayhuaman. But I have, in general, several kind of issues with the geopolymer idea. In either case, either it's geopolymer or it's not, it's, you're still talking about a form of technology that the Inca did not have access to. You know, there's certainly no accounts of the Inca ever making concrete. The Spanish were the first ones to use real concrete. There's some fundamental questions that you've got to be asked Example, you have to cast all of those blocks. You have to make a shape with them. So you have to make a mold. You pour your slurry into the mold and it sets. And if you're building a wall, why is every single block a different shape and size? That means that you have as many molds as there are blocks. Every block is unique, therefore it requires its own mold. Even if you cast your blocks, you then have to make them fit together. And that's a very difficult process. These shapes are very complex, the curved, shapes that extend all the way through the rock. I think they must have been carved or shaped. Somebody had the ability to work with this stone in a fundamental way that we don't understand. I think that's perhaps the best way of, of putting it. And I certainly don't have the answers, but I, when I look at the evidence, that's really all I'm saying is that I just, this doesn't line up with what we know about the Inca's capability. And if they didn't do it, somebody else did. We don't know who that was, and perhaps we should be investigating this whole thing with an open mind with that sort of possibility in mind, as opposed to just ruling it all done by the Inca and just ignoring all of the contradictions that are evident in this architecture. So as we're standing here halfway up the Rodadero or the hillside behind the main wall of Sacsayhuaman, you can see that the, the extrusion, the lava extrusion has had a lot of shapes cut into it. These shapes are pretty classic. Hanan Pacha, the, these are the Inca thrones. This is quite famous, this little area here, but you have some very flat surfaces. Some people think these are quarrying shapes or that they're steps. It's hard to say if that's what they are. There are some really weird shapes at various sites that don't match quarrying marks. They certainly don't match steps at a lot of places. To me, it's just really random almost. This, you have these square shapes cut out of Hanan Pacha, but then you also have these curvature, almost liquid shapes that are carved out. Here's another part of the park that isn't often explored. It's, it's part of the Sacsayhuaman area, but there's a really weird piece of Hanan Pacha here that almost looks as if it's, it's been melted and flowed into place. It's a very strange set of what just looks like absolutely ancient uh, shaped rock. And as you walk around the back of the Rodadero and we get into this really old Hanan Pacha style, you see some evidence for just tremendous cataclysm and just tremendous damage. There's, there's these big chunks of rock have been split apart at some point and they've rolled around. So something's hit this site that's knocked things down. It's split some of these ancient stones apart and moved them around. You kind of have what you could describe as like an upside down staircase in some areas. You can clearly see where the, the walls have been split and you, you can tell that these are worked surfaces. You'll see a lot of like straight stone walls and things like that. So you know this isn't a natural effect, but then also consider how old this looks. This stuff always seems to be just incredibly ancient, really, really eroded relative to the other megalithic work. And it's in this area that I find to be real interesting 
Lots of good examples of the three different styles of architecture. You have the Han and Pacha monolithic work, the, the single piece work. You have the Uru and Pacha cellular megalithic work, the famous style that we see in South America. And then you see all the Inca work that's on top of that. Also here is you have some good evidence for how these stones were shifted around in the cataclysm. And this is actually strong evidence for suggesting that the Uran Pacha, the megalithic cellular work, was in place before the cataclysm happened. Because right here you've got a stone that's actually been moved in this destruction and it's been put and rolled to, to where it's in front of some megalithic blocks. So it means that those blocks had to be there before the cataclysm or before the destruction happened. So you kind of get an idea for the layering. It's one of the very, very few examples I can find where the orders don't always match up. And in this case, it seems to be pretty clear that it's because these rocks have been split and moved around. It's quite a little maze when you get into here. It's very hard to comprehend what these surfaces were for or what this site was made for, even from a ceremonial or symbolic perspective. It's, they're, they're very strange shapes. This part of the park really reminds me of Kenko, the way you move through these giant flat planed surfaces of stone. Here's a good example of circular protection in this small little courtyard. You can see that the Uran Pacha megalithic wall has been formed in a curve in this little depressed area and it's all centered around Hunan Pacha architecture. These shapes cut into these what looks like ancient bits of stone. In the back area of Saxe Huaman, there is also what I could only really call just a giant courtyard, this giant sort of circular area. It, it looks like a place where you could play a pretty good game of cricket if you wanted to. And some people suggest that this was a reservoir, that it was full of water at some point. Uh, it's hard to say what it was really for. It's clear to me that these megalithic builders, they were respecting this more ancient work for some reason. They were, they were it's like a gentle touch almost. You see the same thing again and again in these several megalithic courtyards that are part of Saxe Huaman. There's several of these little circular areas that have foundations of walls and some remaining blocks from walls in them. I'm not sure what the purpose is or was, but you, you can also see that there's really all three layers of architecture at this part of the site. I really love this area because you've got the, the Hanan Pacha, you have the Uran Pacha, and then you have the Inca work, the Ikun Pacha, on top. And it becomes very, very clear that, you know, there was something different going on. This is quite likely the result of three entirely different phases of occupation and building here. Two of those phases coming from quite possibly pre-cataclysmic times. Another beautiful, really small little circular depression. To me, it's, I think of this as kind of like an Inca hot tub. This is like the, uh, the, <laughs> the main suite of Saxe Huaman, and this is the hot tub around the corner. But I, I don't know, it's just, it's just these beautiful little touches that are all over this place. You, you could spend a couple days here and still not discover everything it has to offer. I, uh, I always enjoy going back to Saxe Huaman. It's so easy to get to when you're in Cusco. It's just like if you have an afternoon, you might as well go up and, and hit the site. And it's, it's even lovely there when it rains and hails. I've, I've had all sorts of weather on site when I've been there. There's lots of little tunnels that you can explore. There's one interesting one that you can get into. It's called the Little Chicana or Little Tunnel. It takes about a minute and a minute and a half or thereabouts to go through it. It's, a, it's an interesting experience because right in the middle there, it's absolutely pitch black. It is, there's no trace of light at all. It's, it's a fun experience to go in there and then turn off your light. Uh, you get a sense of what it might have been like to work in these underground spaces. But the site of Saxe Huaman itself is also supposedly home to many other tunnels. And in fact, there's reports of the government actually bricking up access to tunnel systems as far back as the 1920s because people were getting lost down there. And certainly the mythology of these tunnels persists from the Incan times. There is supposed to be a tunnel that leads from Saxe Huaman to the center of Cusco. I think it's actually supposed to come up in the, the center of the Corricancha. Again, I think you're looking at architecture here that has been through at least two periods of major destruction. It's one of the nuances that you have to get used to looking at when it comes to ancient sites. Many of them have been built up by different civilizations, and then many of them have been taken apart by, by other civilizations or quarried. There are a lot of interesting blocks that you can see on some sites, like this block that has the snake motif in it. I'm actually quite surprised that this block is still here. I think a lot of these types of things would have been quite uh, highly prized for quarrying. And you do see snake blocks and these types of motif blocks being used in, in repair work in other areas of Cusco. 
And then over the far back corner of the park at Saxay Huaman, there is just this tremendous, huge stone. It's a massive piece of Hanan Pacha architecture. And this is a, I think this is a natural rock, or it may have been a, a chunk of a hillside that rolled down here. But you can see that there is a lot of shapes and a lot of these Inca thrones that have been carved into this block. Locally, it's known as the Chincana or tunnel block. And there's an interesting legend that surrounds it. This is an Incan legend. And, and then they said that back in the day, there was a tunnel entrance right where this rock rests now. And supposedly this something happened and this rock rolled on top of that entrance. And the Inca were forced to dig their way back down through this giant piece of stone to get back to the tunnel entrance. And what's interesting is as you go around the other side of this giant uh, piece of architecture, you can actually see that there is a staircase and a, and a rock that's been kind of split off from the original uh, block. It looks like a staircase that has been perhaps an internal staircase that's been carved down towards what could be a tunnel entrance. I'm not really sure if this area is actually in the park or not. On the couple of times that I've been here, I've definitely had a couple of guides come over or, or just the park guys with the, the little vests on and their whistles, tooting their whistles at me as if I wasn't supposed to be here. But you can see this uh, if, if you go over the back area of Saxe and I definitely recommend going over and checking out this area. It's, it's very interesting. I do hope you enjoyed that look at Saxe Huaman. It's one of my favorite sites. I wanted this to be a bit more casual. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody that supports the channel. You're really making it possible for me to spend the time to make these videos. So thank you for that. And if you're interested in supporting the channel via the value for value model, you can find out all the details and the ways to do that at unchartedx.com support. Please do check it out. Also, I just wanted to say that I'm pretty active on social media. I post a lot of pictures from a lot of ancient sites and I give production and update news in terms of my videos. If you're interested in anything like that please give me a follow over at twitter or on instagram i even have a discord server you can find out the details for that on my site otherwise i will see you all in the next video peace